Magandang gabi sa inyong lahat, mga kapitid. It's good to see you here tonight. Thank you for being here, and thank you for keeping the rain away. Well, I don't know if you did that. Maybe God did that. I think we thank God for that. But we are grateful that the rain has stopped, and I hope that everything is going okay, and that the heavy rain did not... Uh, disturb you too much. Tonight, we have an exciting subject. Can you go back to the title slide, please? That's what I'd like you to do. Can you go back? Uh, tonight, we have a, a really good subject, a good, exci exciting subject. Um, so we'll just pray and then move on and expect God to speak to us. Our Father in heaven, we come to you in the name of Jesus, and we are thankful. You are a God who blesses your children. You are the giver of all good gifts. We've been blessed today with life and health. And we come to you again asking that you would speak to us. You just blessed us with beautiful music. And now we pray that as we open the Bible, you would speak to us again. We thank you, and we pray in Jesus' name, amen. The Philippines is known for many things. Anybody who knows anything about the Philippines knows it is a beautiful country. And one of the things that I have learned about the Philippines is that there is some wonderful diving, scuba diving in the Philippines. I have not dived in the Philippines, and I don't think that while I am here, I'm going to. We're too busy doing other things. But my son and I, we like to dive together. We've dived together in a number of places, and we have discovered that when you get beneath the surface of the ocean, it's just like you enter a whole new world. You see things that you didn't even know were there. They were there. But until you go down beneath the surface of the water, you don't get to enjoy their great beauty and discover them as God has made them. You dive under the water and you see beautiful fish, fish of many different colors and shapes and sizes with intricate patterns. They're so beautiful. It's wonderful to get down under the water and see them there. Just a couple of months ago, my son and I were diving, and this shark, which is a black-tipped reef shark, came swimming by us about three meters away, just went right past. In fact, there were many of them. We saw maybe eight or 10 or maybe even 15 of these sharks. I'm just glad they weren't hungry. <laughs> they didn't seem too interested in us. Now, maybe a year or so ago in Indonesia, I was diving, and I saw this critter, this very one. This is a moray eel. And I didn't get to within three meters of this one. I got to within about uh, maybe, what would it be, 70 centimeters. We got close, more close than I wanted to get, but I was told by my friend with the camera that these eels have very bad eyesight. So hopefully they couldn't see me. And hopefully if they were gonna go after somebody, they would get the guy with the camera, and maybe I would be okay. You see rays like this one on the bottom of the ocean floor, and then rays like this one. Great big manta rays from wingtip to wingtip. It's about five meters, maybe longer. And we got close enough to these that if we wanted to, and of course we did not, we could have reached out and touched them. They came flying right over our heads. They're beautiful. But whenever I dive, I think the thing that I like the most is to see sea turtles. 
Oh, they're just fantastic. There's nothing like them. And if I can ever see a turtle beneath the surface of the ocean, I feel like I've been really blessed by God and I've had a wonderful day. My son recorded that footage of the turtle swimming by and I just love to see them. When you get down under the water, sometimes you may see a ship, you dive on a ship, or even a plane, depending on where you are. When you get under the water, there's always another discovery to be made. It's something like that when you travel to another country. I visited India, and we went to see the Taj Mahal. Oh, I tell you something. You go to the Taj Mahal complex, and then we walked around the corner. Can you advance the slide? I don't know what's happening. Walked around the corner, and then there it was, the Taj Mahal. I'm pretty certain I took that photo myself. Just there, boom. It is really something. It's wonderful to see. You go inside the Taj Mahal, there's not anything really to see. But from the outside, it is splendid. You visit Rome. You know what I'm going to do? I don't, I don't know if that was me or you. Give me a second. I'm sorry. But this should not be giving me grief. You know what I'm going to do? Sorry to do this. See if you can get that fixed. Could you do that? I don't know if you can work a miracle or laying on of hands or what. But if you can try and get that fixed, I would really appreciate it. Go back. Go back one. Can you do that for me, please? When you visit Rome and Italy, I'd like to show you a picture of the Colosseum if we have it here. No, maybe it's not there. My mistake. That'll do. Uh, the Colosseum is fantastic. It is iconic. It is an old, old, ancient building. In fact, they built the Colosseum with money. Now, you might need to take it to somebody. They built the Colosseum with money that they got from destroying Jerusalem and attacking Jerusalem in the year 70 AD. Fascinating. And then you get to the, the Forum and places like it in uh, Rome. You can travel to Israel and go to the Temple Mount and see the Dome of the Rock and see that very historic place and see the sites where Jesus walked, where Jesus lived. Those things are already there in other countries. But when you travel there, you make these, these well, they're not really discoveries, but you see things that you've, you've never seen before. It's just so interesting. A man in England, let's go on, a man in England thought that the little brass cup that he kept in a box under his bed was worth nothing. It had belonged to his grandfather. His grandfather was a scrap metal collector. And his grandfather brought this little brass cup home, it's only about this tall, and gave it to his son, and his son gave it to his son, and the grandson kept that thing and figured, there's nothing valuable about this. But then one day he was looking at it, and he said, is this really brass? I wonder if it's brass. So he sent it to the British Museum, and he discovered that it wasn't brass at all, but instead it was gold. And it dated, thank you, to the 4th or the 5th century B.C. and was worth more than 5 million pesos. You see, when you take a closer look, whether you're under the water or visiting another country or looking at an artifact or something old, when you take another look, when you take a closer look, you may be surprised, you may be blessed by what you find, you may make some incredible discoveries. A couple in the United States was walking their dog one day out on their farm when the husband noticed something just sticking up out of the ground. They had walked that way many times, but he'd never seen this. And he had a stick and he went over and he said, I wonder what this is. And he jabbed it and he realized it was an old tin can. So he began to dig into the ground and what he found really amazed him. By the time he and his wife were done, they found eight cans containing 1,427 gold coins. You know what they were valued at? They were valued at over half a billion pesos in value. When you keep your eyes open, 
when you go to a new place, when you look, when you scratch beneath the surface, you make amazing discoveries. And tonight, we are going to go to the Bible, and we're going to get beneath the surface, and we're going to dig deep, and we're going to make an amazing discovery. When you come to the Bible, you want to keep your eyes open because there are discoveries in the Bible waiting to be made, things that you might never have seen before. In the book of Revelation chapter 14, the Bible says in verse 6, Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come. And notice this, it says, And worship him who made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. In these Bible verses, we are being called to worship God as the creator. Let me say that another way. We are being called to worship the creator God. The Bible tells us that Jesus is actually, was actually the active agent at creation. So when we are being called to worship the creator, this is a call to honor and worship Jesus. John 1 starts by saying, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made which was made. Christ Jesus is the creator, and we are called in the Bible to worship him, the maker of all things. But since the time of Charles Darwin, the theory of evolution has become increasingly popular. It is fashionable in certain circles to doubt the Bible and to cling to alternative theories to explain the existence of all things. But evolution doesn't have room for one very important thing. Evolutionary theory does not make room for a loving creator God who loves his children. But you find that when you get into the Bible. The verses we read, the verses we read in Revelation lead us to a wonderful discovery that speaks of the love of God, that shows us how interested God is in blessing us and helping us to get the most out of life. The Bible says that the earth was created in six days. On the first creation day, God said, let there be light. And there was light. And on each of the next five days, or should I say, every day for five days, God created. Every day for five days, God created. And as he created... He continued to add to the beauty of the world in preparation for what he would do on day six. You see, the Bible says, by the word of the Lord, the heavens were made and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. For he spoke and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. How did God create? He spoke and there is such power in the word of God that the word of God is able to bring something out of nothing. God spoke, and the earth and everything therein were brought into existence. On the second day of creation, God created the sky and the sea. On the third day of creation, God made the land and the vegetation. On day four, the sun, the moon, and the stars. On the fifth day of creation week, our mighty God made the sea creatures and the birds. And then on day six, God made animals and then the crowning act of his creation. God made Adam and from Adam he made Eve. Six days of creation, light, the sky and the sea. Land and vegetation, the sun, the moon, and the stars. 
sea creatures and birds, animals, and then he made somebody to enjoy it all. He made the original human family. Could you improve on that? I don't think you could. But then God went ahead and completed his work of creation. Genesis 2 verse 2 says, And on the seventh day, God ended his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. Why did God rest? Was he tired? No, God wasn't tired. God was ceasing from that work and enjoying his creativity. God created for six days. And then on the seventh day, he gave us a memorial. He gave us a memorial of his creative power. That eternal sign God gave us on the seventh day is a sign of God's ability to create and to recreate. God's memorial is unlike any other memorial you can think of. We're going to take a closer look now. We're going to go beneath the surface. We're going to start digging deeper and discover more about God's special memorial. Genesis 2 verse 3 says, And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it he had rested from all his work, which God created and made. The seventh day Sabbath was given at creation. It was given to be an eternal sign, a reminder that we were made by God in the image of God, that we were made for an eternal purpose. And God blessed that day. The Bible says God sanctified the seventh day Sabbath. That means he set it apart for a holy purpose as a reminder of who God is and who he made us to be. Here's something interesting. How many days are there in a week? Can you tell me? Seven days. Do you know why we have a seven-day week today? There's only one reason. The month is 28 days long, or thereabouts, because that's how long it takes the moon to get around the earth. The year is 365 days, 6 hours and 11 minutes long. Because that's how long it takes the earth to get around the sun. But why is the week 7 days long? Not because of what the moon does, not because of what the earth does, and not because of what the sun does. The uh, the week is 7 days long because that's how long it took God to make the earth, the moon, the sun, and everything else. And of course, then he rested on the seventh day. We have a seven-day week because it speaks to us about the fact that in the beginning, God created. There are three specific things that God did on the Sabbath, that first Sabbath, things that only God could do. First, he blessed the day. He sanctified the day. And he rested on the day. There's only one day upon which God did those special things. That was that original seventh day, helping us to understand that the seventh day that he gave to us is special, an eternal sign of his powerful creation and his infinite love. The only day God blessed was the seventh day Sabbath. And at Mount Sinai, when God wrote the Ten Commandments with his own finger, when God wrote the Ten Commandments on stone to help us understand that they would never pass away, when God wrote down the Ten Commandments, he spoke a little differently about the Sabbath commandment. He didn't say, thou shalt, and he didn't say, thou shalt not. God started this one by saying, remember, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all of your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you nor your son nor your daughter nor your manservant or your male servant, your manservant or your female servant, or your cattle, nor the stranger who is within your gates. Listen, this was not something new. 
God's people had heard this before. That's why God said, remember. And I want you to notice this. God said that this is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. Now, this is really important because I heard somebody say that the Sabbath was made by God, especially for Jewish people. Well, undoubtedly it was made for Jewish people, but it was made for all people. The Bible says it's the Sabbath of the Lord your God. And when the Sabbath was made, there were no Jews living on the earth, not even one. So the Sabbath is not something that was intended for Jews. The Sabbath is something that was made for everybody. Thou shalt not kill, that's not just for the Jews. Thou shalt not commit adultery, that's for everybody. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, that's for everybody too. And keep in mind, the Sabbath was made 2,300 years before the Jewish race came into existence. And so we go back now to Exodus chapter 20 and verse 11. For in six days, the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, and he rested the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and he hallowed it. Remember this, God created for six days and then he carved the Sabbath out of the rock of time. God created for six days and then he gave the human family a memorial. He said, if you hang on to this, if you observe this, if you remember this, then you will never forget that I am God and you are the work of my hands. You can hear the That helps. We'll find out. Thank you. You know what I think it is? Do you know what I think it is? I think it's the durian. I think it's the durian. I had durian twice today. And maybe my body just can't handle the, the durian. I have to, have, to, have to work up to it. Does everybody in the Philippines like durian? Yes or no? Oh, I heard some no's. The first time I tried durian, I was in Singapore. And my friend took me to a wonderful place to eat and we ate so much food, it was just wonderful. And then he said, now I have something really special for you. Durian. I had been worrying about this. I'd never tried durian before and I was kind of worried. And he took me to a place and he was just so glad and they cut open a durian and he started to eat the durian and his children started to eat the durian and they pushed some towards me. And I eyed it with suspicion. <laughs> and of course I could smell it. And I picked it up and I knew what I had to do. I had to try the durian, I had to. So I took a bite of durian. That was a good thing. But then I made a mistake. I swallowed it. <laughs> and the durian went down, 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 <clears throat> hit the bottom. And then it called up to me and it said, I'm coming back up. I said, no, you're not. And the durian said, yes, I am. And I'm bringing my friends with me. <laughs> no. And I started to wrestle with myself. Stay down, stay down. And the durian was saying, I'm coming up. And my friends were sitting there laughing at me. Well, I finally managed to pull myself together. And he said, well, what did you think? And I said, not so bad, <laughs> which was a lie. He said, try some more. Oh, no. So I tried some more. I, oh, I said, I can't do this any longer. And I thought I might die. Then a few years later, I was in Malaysia. And some friends took me to a durian plantation. And we tried durian. As a matter of fact, they knew about my first experience. 
And I have a photograph somewhere of me holding my piece of durian. And all these folks are standing around with the cameras waiting to catch the moment. So I ate the durian and I, I survived. I survived. The next day, some other friends, they took me and they, they, we had lunch and then they said, let's eat durian. And I said, oh no. But I ate the durian. And I said, that's not bad. They said, try this one. I said, oh, this is even better. Have this? Oh, I like that. And that night as I lay on my bed, all I could think about was, where can I get more durian? <laughs> I think I got addicted to durian. And so one day some friend brought some durian to my house. And I said, I've got to put this in the fridge. And my wife said, you cannot put that in the fridge. <laughs> I said, why not? She said, do you know what that smells like? I said, oh, I like it. And my son said, oh no, we have to put the durian in the fridge. And my wife said, either the durian goes or I go. <laughs> and I looked at my son and he shrugged his shoulders and I shrugged my shoulders and I turned to my wife and I said, we're really going to miss you. Durian. Nah. I think we're gonna I think when we get to heaven it's gonna be on the tree of life. <laughs> right next to the kiwi fruit from New Zealand. So where were we? God created in six days. Hey, wait a minute, what day did he create the durian on? That was a good day. He made the vegetation on day three, so I'm guessing that's when the durian were made. That was a good day. God created for six days, and then he rested on the seventh day. I want you to notice what Ezekiel wrote. This is God speaking. He said, moreover, I also gave them my Sabbaths. Okay, why did you give us the Sabbath? To be a sign between them and me so that they might know that I am the Lord who sanctifies them. To sanctify is to set apart for a holy use or to make holy. Who is it that can make you holy? God, only God. How do we know that? Because he's the creator. And when you fall into sin and you need to be recreated, God can do that. Who can recreate a broken person? Only the creator. And we are reminded of his power and his creative power every week when the seventh day comes around and we say, it's the Sabbath, it is a sign that God can make and remake us. I gotta tell you something, if you are a broken sinner and you want to be made new, evolution cannot help you. When David prayed, he did not pray, evolve in me a clean heart. He prayed and said, create in me a clean heart. And it's the creator God who can recreate you. Well, when you look at the life of Jesus, you discover that Jesus related to the Sabbath in a certain way. The Bible says in Luke 4 and verse 16, he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the what day? Tell me, on the Sabbath day. And he stood up for to read. If you were living in Jesus' time and you were following Jesus to church, you would have followed Jesus to church on the Sabbath. He kept the Sabbath. And remember, he was the creator. He made the Sabbath in the first place. Now, if you were to wonder what day the seventh-day Sabbath is, you say, well, I would like to keep the Sabbath. I want to do what God wants me to do. I want to honor and observe this memorial of God's creative power, but what day do I do it? There are seven days in the week. Which one is the Sabbath? Well, the Bible tells us, and the Bible tells us really clearly. This is what I love about the Bible. You know, when you can go to the Bible, this you are reading the Word of God. The Word of God. You know something? There are some people, if you were going to read their Word, you couldn't understand it because it's written in a language you don't know. 
The word of God is expressed to us in language that we can understand. It is made accessible to us. And when it comes to the Sabbath, the word of God is clear. Luke 23, verse 52. This man, Joseph of Arimathea, went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then he took it down, wrapped it in linen, laid it in a tomb that was hewn out of the rock where no one had ever lain before. That day was the what? And what day drew near? And the Sabbath drew near. And the women which had come from Galilee followed after, and they observed the tomb and how his body was laid. And they returned and prepared spices and fragrant oils, and they rested on the Sabbath according to the commandment. And that's really important. So the Bible says Jesus died on the, what day was that? Preparation day. And the next day was the Sabbath day. And then the next day is called the first day of the week. So let's see if we can understand this. Now on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they and certain other women with them came to the tomb bringing the spices which they had prepared. So this is laid out for us really plainly. Jesus died on the preparation day. As a matter of fact, every Easter, we refer to the day on which Jesus died as Good Friday. The next day was the Sabbath, and the next day was the first day of the week on which Jesus rose, and we call that Easter Sunday. Okay, so Jesus died on Good Friday. He rose from the dead on Easter Sunday, and the day between Friday and Sunday is the day that we call Saturday. That is the seventh day of the week. It is the seventh day Sabbath. If you go to the dictionary, the dictionary will tell you Saturday, seventh day of the week. By the way, if you look under Sunday, it will tell you Sunday is the first day of the week. Look at the languages of the world. Oh, my goodness. The languages of the world. In English, Saturday. In Espanol, Sabado. In Russian, Subota. In Italian, Sabato. In Tagalog. How about that? Isn't that easy? Sabado, Sabado. Sabbath. The name in so many languages around the world for Saturday, the seventh day of the week, is simply Sabbath. It's a wonderful way that God has preserved for us our correct understanding of these things. Take a look at the calendar. Now, modern calendars have changed a little bit, but the calendar always said that the seventh day of the week was Saturday. And we thank God for that, you understand. It's so important the Sabbath day is so important that God wrote it with his own finger. He wrote the Sabbath commandment with his own finger, and he wrote it on tables of stone, not in the sand. Man, if it had been written in the sand, the wind would have come and blown that writing away. But God wrote it in stone to help us to understand that it's not something that would ever pass away. So we know that Jesus kept the Sabbath. We know that. But what did his followers do? Some people have the idea that after Jesus died, his followers did a whole new thing, but that's not right. And if you are a follower of Jesus, you want to follow him in all that he did. You want to live the way he lived. You want to obey God like he obeyed God. That's the right thing to do. No question about that. So in Luke 17 and verse 2, the Bible says, Then Paul, as his custom was, went into them and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the Scriptures. It was Paul's custom to keep the seventh-day Sabbath. Acts 13, verse 42. When the Jews went out of the synagogue, the Gentiles begged that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. Listen, you know if the Sabbath had been changed when Jesus died, the Gentiles would have just gone to church on Sunday. Jews kept the Sabbath. The Gentiles did exactly the same. On the next Sabbath, almost the whole city came together to hear the word of God. The seventh day Sabbath is mentioned in the New Testament more than 50 times. And not once does the Bible say anything about it being changed. In fact, 
Jesus referred specifically to keeping the Sabbath and told us that we would keep the Sabbath long after he died. Look at this. Jesus is talking about the destruction of Jerusalem. And he says in Matthew chapter 24, Woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days. And pray that your flight may not be in winter or on the... Okay, so Jesus was expecting that the people that he was talking to would be keeping the Sabbath 40 years after he died. So do you think God wants for us to keep the Sabbath day to holy today? No question. It's written in the commandments. There's no doubt about it. And Jesus said here, four decades after I die, Jerusalem will be destroyed. You better pray it doesn't happen on the Sabbath because if it does, you'll be worshiping. If it does, you won't be out of town. If it does, you will be easily swept away by the attackers who are coming into Jerusalem. So what happened then when Jesus died on the cross? When Jesus died on the cross, he brought an end to a certain system. Not the Ten Commandments, but to the system of ceremonies and types and shadows. When Jesus died on the cross, the ceremonial law came to an end. No more were people expected to offer animal sacrifices. The sacrificial system ended when Jesus died on the cross. No longer was anybody needing to keep the Passover or the Feast of Trumpets or the Feast of Tabernacles or Pentecost. No longer, because when Jesus died, that old system came to an end. But when Jesus died, did it become acceptable to kill people? No. Did it become okay to steal? No, no. When Jesus died, the ceremonial laws passed away, but the Ten Commandments remained as important as they had ever been, still important to God. So now I have a question for you. When, when should a person keep the seventh-day Sabbath? The Bible says that the Sabbath is to be kept from sunset to sunset. The Bible's clear about that. So that means the Sabbath would begin at sunset on Friday night, and it would end sunset on Saturday night. And depending on when the sun sets, it might be a little earlier, it might be a little later. In some parts of the world, it shifts around quite dramatically. In other parts of the world, it's kind of uniform. But the Sabbath is to be observed from sundown Friday to sundown Saturday. And so now we know this. Jesus kept the seventh-day Sabbath when he was alive. His followers kept the seventh-day Sabbath after Jesus' death. But notice this, Isaiah wrote, For as the new heavens and the new earth, which I make, shall remain before me, saith the Lord, so shall your descendants and your name remain. God is looking way into the future. And he says, And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another, and from one what to another? One Sabbath to another, all flesh shall come to worship before me, says the Lord. Man, can you imagine what it's going to be like to worship God on the Sabbath in heaven? Oh, can you imagine? Maybe the Apostle Paul will do the Bible study class. Maybe Jesus himself will stand and preach. I don't know. But we'll all come together in eternity, in the earth made new, and remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. We're going to recognize God as our creator. You know, God's creative power is what separates God from all of the false gods. He gives us the Sabbath day to remember that, and he invites us to come into close relationship with him based on that principle. I am glad that God never changed the Sabbath, and I think you are too. The Sabbath day was intended to be a release from the pressures of life. You know, if there were eight days in a week, if there were 10 days in a week, some people would work eight days. Some people would work 10 days. There are seven days in the week, and some people never get a break. And God says, take a break. I'll tell you what. There are some people who feel like they have to work seven days in order to survive. I can understand that. And it's not just people who don't have much money who feel that way. Sometimes the pressures of having a lot of money drives wealthy people to work seven days a week. And it's not good. That's when your body breaks down. 
It's when your mind breaks down. It's when your family breaks down. It's when your marriage breaks down. It's when relationships break down. When you don't take time, this places a great strain on you, on your family, on your relationships. When you take that time, you may think you're giving up time, but you're not. You're honoring God and you are investing in relationships. You're investing in yourself. You're investing in what's most important. You see, most people, many people, tend to push things too hard. They overdo it, but God says, take a deep breath. Relax for a moment. Step back from the things of the world. It's so demanding. God says, take time with God. It's quality time. Take time for worship. That's quality time. Take time away from the pressures of this life. That's quality time. Interrupt your work schedule so you can have a God schedule. The Sabbath is time made for you by God so that your life, your health, your mind, your family, your marriage, your relationships can all be enhanced and blessed. I want you to think about what the Sabbath commandment or the existence of the Sabbath day says about God. It says a lot. God was thinking of you when he made the Sabbath. He said, they will need this. He's thinking of you. God cares about your family. He says, families need time together, and they need to take a break from busyness. Think about what God was saying about himself. God was saying, take a day and spend that with me. Isn't that special? God wants us to be able to connect with him. Think about what this says about God. There are some people that you can't spend time with because they're too busy or they're too important. Can you imagine just turning up to the president's house and saying, President Duterte, I just had an idea that we'd spend some time together today. And the president would say something like, well, that's a very nice idea, but you know I'm busy running a country. I can't just take a day off to spend with you. Every Sabbath, God says, come on. Let's spend time together. God is telling you he has time for you. The Sabbath demonstrates God has time for you. And he wants to spend that time with you because God is love and he loves nothing more than his children and spending time with them. God wants you to get the most out of life. The Sabbath is a step up. The Sabbath is a step better. The Sabbath is you getting more out of life. The Sabbath is you getting more out of your relationship with God. Oh, that's a wonderful thing. That's the kind of God that we serve. You know, I've met people, they say, but I keep every day holy. You can't keep every day holy because not every day is holy. God gave us one holy day, the Sabbath, and he said to us, keep that holy. Now, I know we ought to worship God every day. We want to love God every day, but God didn't ask us to keep every day holy. Now, listen very carefully. I am not suggesting to you tonight that the fourth commandment is more important than the other commandments. Oh, that's not true. But what I do want you to know is that the fourth commandment is no less important than the other commandments. But what do so many Christians do? Most Christians, they're not gonna kill you. They don't wanna steal. They certainly shouldn't lie. They'll tell you, we believe in the 10 commandments. Except for the fourth commandment. Except for the fourth. Now that would be the nine commandments. And the Bible doesn't speak about the nine commandments. Christian believers will say, oh, we believe. We believe in the Bible. Sure we do. But the Bible says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. So why aren't we doing that? Well, when we're here on Friday night, we'll talk a bit more about why we're not doing that. But people aren't doing that because they've been taught otherwise. 
They've been told Sunday is God's day. Sunday is the Sabbath day. Sunday is the worship day. Except tonight, we've strapped our tanks on our back and made sure our regulator's working and we put our fins on and our goggles on and we've gone down beneath the surface and we've looked into the word of God and what do you know? It says the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. That's what the Bible says. Sunday is the first day you see. You know what James said? James said, whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, that person is guilty of how much? All. That's significant, isn't it? You have somebody who loves the Lord and maybe they've just been told wrong. Maybe they've been told differently. Maybe they were raised thinking that seventh day is not important and the first day is important. Or maybe they were raised to think that nothing is important. And then you look into the Bible and you say, well, that's clear. This is not ambiguous. This is not difficult to understand. But those people who keep nine commandments are breaking the fourth commandment. And James says, they're guilty of breaking them all. And we don't want to be that person. We just don't. And you know why? Because Jesus said, if you love me, do what? Keep my commandments. So you see what this comes down to? It comes down to what, can you tell me? It comes down to love. It comes down to love for God. Why should we love God? He made you. Why else should we love God? Because Jesus died for you. Why else? Because he went to heaven where he is interceding for you as your high priest. Why else? Because God offers you forgiveness of sin. He opens up for you the door of heaven and you might say, ah, but I'm a bad guy. Okay, Jesus died for bad guys. You might say, but I live a shameful life. I've done some things that I'm not proud of. Same for David, same for Solomon, same for the apostle Paul who when he was Saul persecuted the church. When Saul became a Christian, church members were afraid of him. And yet when you get to heaven, you are going to see Paul. Thank God for that. Because God delights in forgiving us for our sin and remaking us. The Sabbath reminds us that God is our maker and our remaker. This is good news. Imagine what you've been missing. I didn't know what was under the surface of the ocean. Well, I'd seen things on magazines and television, I suppose, but I hadn't seen it up close. And I got down beneath there and I said, it's a whole new world here. I visited the Taj Mahal. I said, I'd only seen this in pictures. Look at this. This is better than I've imagined. We come to the Bible and we say, what can we find in here? And we look and we say, ah, oh, wow, I've discovered something. It's better than finding 1,427 gold coins. It's the Sabbath. It's a day of rest and gladness. It is time with God. It is time away from work, away from our secular pursuits. Wow, what a discovery. It was there in the Bible all along. We didn't have to, we didn't have to look through any symbols. Not that symbols are bad things. It's just right there. We didn't have to find days that represent years and then put down a timeline. Nothing wrong with that. But we didn't have to do that. It's just right there. God says, here, this is for you. This is a gift. Why? Because God says, I want the best for you. Because God says, I want you to get the most out of life. Because God says, I want you to be more blessed than you have ever, ever been. This is what God says. God wants to add to your experience. If you didn't know this, then you can say, thank God. Now I know, not, oh, wow, I'm so confused. You say, thank God. The reason you now know is because God wants you to grow and, and have a more full experience and be closer to God. Now, you don't want to make the mistake of saying, I've never done that. That's not what my parents did. That's not what my church teaches. You don't want to make that mistake. 
I'm not going to change now. Hold on. Yes, you are. How do I know that? Because you love God. And Jesus said, if you love me, then you will do what? Come on, I want everybody to say that. If you love me, you'll do what? You will keep my commandments. And you won't be sour about it. You won't be sorry about it. You'll say, praise the Lord. It's the will of God. After all, God has done for me. After Jesus died for me on a cross, I want to do God's will. He has written it in my heart, and I delight to do thy will, oh my God. You know what happens? New smartphone comes out. Somebody told me there's going to be another one out a few months from now. And people say, got to have it. I want that new one. If you can afford it, I want that new one. Why? Well, it's better. It's got more. It does this. I want it. I want to increase my experience. I don't know many people. You may, but I don't who have a telephone in their house attached to the wall. I don't know what happened to them. They seem to be disappearing. You know why? Because when cell phones came along, people said, ah, that's better, that's better. You know, when I was a little boy, or maybe even before I was born, when my mother did the laundry, she would have to heat water up in something that we called the copper. It was some great big contraption. She had an old-fashioned way of doing the laundry, and it took forever. But somebody said, hey, wait a minute. You can buy one of these newfangled washing machines now with an agitator in it. It went backwards and forwards. And then you had to put the clothes through the wringer. It would squeeze the water out. And my mother said, oh, I'd like that. And then years later, when even newer washing machines came out, and when my parents could afford it, my mother said, i got to get one of those. And she got a nice one. Because that's what we do. When there are improvements, if it's practical, and if it's affordable, we get them. Why would it be any different in your spiritual life? Why? When you find something that God has for you, and it's an improvement, you don't want to stay stuck in the Stone Age. You don't want to stay in the past. You want to go forward with God. God wants you to progress spiritually. We are happier when we grow in our faith in God. God shows us new things because he wants more for us. When you take a closer look, it's incredible what you'll find in the Bible you'll find blessings that you didn't even know existed. Back in 1975, a man who worked at an assembly plant where cars were manufactured in Italy, this Italian auto worker stopped on his way home at the police station, and here's why. Because on a certain night, once a month, I think it was, the police would auction items that were found on on city trains. People ride the train, they leave things behind. They get turned into the police station, the police would hang on to them, hang on to them, hang on to them, sell them at auction. And so this man went to the police station just to see what he might be able to buy at the auction. And he spotted two paintings. He said, they would look good in the kitchen right above the table where I have my breakfast. And every morning when I eat my breakfast, I could look up at these two simple paintings And I could say, I like them. He asked about them, and he was told that those two paintings were garbage. He said, well, I kind of like them. And rather than have them thrown in the trash, I'm going to bid on them and see if I can buy them. And if they don't cost too much, I'll take them home. 
So he started to bid on the paintings. And another man started to bid on the painting. He bid, and he bid, and he bid, and he bid. And the price went up, 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 up to the equivalent of 1,500 pesos. 1,500 pesos. And finally, the auctioneer said, sold. And he bought them. And he took them home, and he showed his wife, and she agreed that they were nice. And they would put them on the wall in the kitchen above the table where they ate their breakfast together. They hung on the wall of that kitchen for 30 years until one day the man's son came home from university where he studied art history. And he said to his father, you know what, Dad? One of those paintings looks familiar to me. Looks familiar. It looks a lot like the paintings produced by the French painter Pierre Bonnard. So the son studied into it and he discovered that what his father had bought was actually a rare painting painted by a French master. It'd been left on the train that traveled between Paris and Turin in the north of Italy, Turin in the north of Italy. Son said, I wonder about the other painting. And he discovered that the other painting had been painted by the master Paul Gauguin. He paid 1,500 pesos for them. <laughs> they were hanging on the wall of his kitchen. They should have been hanging in a museum. He sold them at auction. What did he pay for them? Do you remember what he paid for them? 1,500 pesos. You know what he sold them for? Listen. He sold them for two and a half billion pesos. Is that a lot of money? He had paintings worth two and a half billion pesos on his kitchen wall. Half the time, he didn't even lock his house. And there they were. He didn't know what he had. He had a fortune. Just didn't know. Didn't know what he had. Come on now, think about this in terms of the Bible. Think about this. The Bible says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. It's been there all along. A memorial of God's creative power. A special sign pointing us to God as the one who created the universe and as the one who can recreate you. Whatever your sin, he can recreate you. Whatever your brokenness or your dysfunction, he can recreate you. Whatever your weaknesses, whatever your failings, whatever you've done wrong, God can recreate you and the Sabbath shows us that. It's the memorial of, creative, of God's creative power, the memorial of creation. God spoke and the world came into existence. Jesus one day stood up in a boat. He said, peace be still. And the wind and the waves calmed down. Jesus one day spoke and he said to some men, take this water and put it in a jug. And they did. And he said, now take that water out and take it to the governor of the feast. The water had turned to wine through the power of his word. God speaks his word into your heart tonight. He says, peace be still. God says, neither do I condemn thee. You think of that woman taken in adultery. And she was concerned that she was going to be stoned by a bunch of angry men. Jesus said, woman, where are those thine accusers? She said, there's nobody here. And Jesus said, neither do I condemn thee. You go now and sin no more. The power of his word had brought forgiveness into her heart. The power of his word had brought 
hope into her life. It can do the same for you, the power of God's word. Forgiveness and hope. The seventh-day Sabbath is a memorial of God's creative power. And God offers you tonight the opportunity to walk close with Jesus. Quality time. A day with God. A day in His presence. Friend, you've got something precious in Jesus. Do you know what you've got? Do you know how precious Jesus is? Do you know what it's worth to have a savior like Jesus? Be blessed as Victor sings the words of this beautiful song and think about what God wants to do in your life and how he gives you the gift of eternity.